is the Word. Here in the flesh, living among the meek and lowly, the voice of God is every breath. Salvation of the world unfolding. Be up your eyes, see the Son of Heaven. Hosanna, Hosanna, pour out your praise, sing the name of Jesus. This is as high upon the cross and from his wounds his mercy flowing and now the dawn put death to death and ever since that grace been empty behold him behold him lift up your eyes Thank you, worship team. 
Oh, it is good to be in church today. Are you excited to be here? Oh, man, let me tell you, I believe in resurrection power because a week ago, it felt like the grave was closer than life. Uh, I was not in good shape, but man, God is good. God is favorable. It's great to be restored. Great to be back in the saddle this morning. And I know Jesus has a great worship experience for us today. I'm excited to get into worship. Are you? Oh, man, it's going to be great. My name is Eric. I'm the lead pastor here. If it's your first time at Hillside Assembly, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We love Jesus, and we love being about the things that Jesus calls us to. And that's what we'll be talking about all day long today. Uh, we do things a little bit differently here at Hillside Assembly. We'll give you an opportunity to give of your tithes and offerings at the end of service. There's a giving box in our foyer that you can put your offering in. Uh, you can also give online at hillsideassembly.org at any time. And so uh, it's great to have our online audience with us as well. I know that there are some people tuning in today because they've been in surgery or not feeling well, and we just want to let you know Jesus is at work, and we're not done. He's not done working in your life yet. I want to cover just a few quick announcements, and then we're going to get into it. Who was here last week? Was Josh not awesome? I watched online, guys. It was incredible. I wanted to be here so bad. He did a phenomenal job. What a great message. Uh, and man, I'm just pumped about missions. So if you didn't have a chance to fill out a myth, uh, missions pledge, we've got those in the foyer. I encourage you, make a missions pledge. Go, Lord, what can I give to missions this next year? Fill that out. Put it in there. Let us know that you're doing that. That would be great. It helps us plan our missions budget. And then also, if you didn't give an, get an opportunity to give to uh, one of our two college students, or to our college students, uh, Jeremy is uh, going to be interning with Mary Ann Adams in Indonesia, and then Allie is going to be doing missions work in Alaska. Uh, if you want to give to them, just mark so in your memo, on your check envelope, or on online giving, and we will split what comes in between the two of them. Uh, and so I love that we're sending young people out into the missions field. Amen? Amen. You got some apple seeds we're planting? Uh, see, I paid attention last week. Some of you were like, I don't remember anything about apples. Got to go back and watch the service. It was excellent. Listen, I don't want to waste any more time. I'm going to talk more about some of the other things that are coming up in my message today. But the most important thing right now is that we have an opportunity to connect with Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is in this place, and he's ready to do some work in your life. Would you stand to your feet? Because we want to pray, and we want to welcome Jesus, the Holy Spirit, here today. Lord, we thank you. And God, as we come into this place today, Lord, there's a lot of baggage that we might be carrying into here. Maybe we had a really tough week. Maybe we're going through a situation in our life and it just, it's excruciating. It feels like the wind's been knocked out of us. Or Lord, maybe we're looking to the future and we're thinking about what we got to get done yet today before the work week starts. Or we're thinking about this work week and the things that need to happen and Lord, in this moment, just empower us to let that all go. Because the most important thing is to spend time with you. That you're here in this place, and we welcome you here to move in this place. Lord, I believe as we begin to worship today, that your spirit is going to move, both here, those watching online, those who don't have any interaction to church maybe at all today, but you're going to move in powerful ways. God, I believe that there's healing and restoration. And I believe there's still some miracles to be done in this room. So Lord, we ask you to move in ways that only you can move. And Lord, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, like a sponge being wrung out, Lord, can we take the next few moments and just wring the worship out of us because you'll fill us back up with your word. But Lord, just, just let us just lavish on you and worship you with our words and to spend time in your presence. Lord, we give you praise, glory, and honor. And God's people said, Amen. let's worship the king together this morning.
Quite a storm we had yesterday, huh? Wasn't expecting that at all. <laughs> In the middle of storms, though, maybe you faced a storm this week different than the snow. We can raise a hallelujah to the Lord. We can sing our song of praise to him. Go ahead and start that when you're ready. Let's raise our hallelujah to the Lord. If you want to lift your hands, you can lift your hands. But let's just praise him this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. 
at work and move in our hearts this morning. Even in those times when we may not see it, God, we know that you are working. You never stop. God, give us faith to believe that, to know that you are working no matter what storm we may face. God, you are here. And even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Come on, sing it out of faith. You never stop. Working. Even when I don't see it. Even when I don't see it. You're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you are here. worship you, I worship you, you are here working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are here moving in our midst, I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Lord, I still believe you are a miracle working God. I believe you make a way where there seems to be no way. If you're here this morning and you need God to make a way for you, we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to ask you to even tell us what it is. But just to acknowledge to the king that you need him to make a way for you right now, would you just raise your hand in this place? Thank you. People all over this place. You know what? Would you just grab a shoulder of somebody next to you in an appropriate way? Begin to pray for them. You may not even know their name. That's okay. Jesus knows who they are. Begin to pray for them. That God would begin to make a way. The miracles would begin to happen that need to happen in their life. Lord, this morning, we believe that you are a miracle-working God. Lord, we pray for Nancy Liskey this morning, who is recovering from back surgery, not able to come home, that, God, you would do a miracle in her life that you're not done moving, that, God, you would bring those vertebrae together, those bones together, that the pain would begin to release and subside in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for Judy Gamal's husband, who was diagnosed with cancer once again. But, God, you healed him once. I believe you can do it again. Do a mighty miracle in his life. We pray for Jean Enterline this morning. You would restore her body with vigor and excitement, her mind with wholeness and healing. And, Lord, we pray, Lord, this morning for every hand that was raised. Lord, an opportunity to see you move in their life. You do not disappoint. So God, make a way where there seems to be no way. Help us grow in the midst of our suffering and our pain. Take us to a deeper level with you. God, help us to, to see you at a different perspective, to see ourselves the way you see us, to see others the way you see them. God, move. Because we need a Savior in our life. Jesus, thank you so much for never giving up on your people. For looking at the world we live in and saying, I'm not done doing great things. I'm not done saving people. I'm not done changing my church and empowering my church to make a difference. You are an amazing 
loving God, and we love our Lord. Thank you for saving us and changing us and never giving up on us. You are awesome. Lord, we love you. Jesus, thank you. And God's people, with all the muster inside of them, said amen. Amen. Man, you can have a seat this morning. Worship team, great job. Man, I love our worship leaders, whether it's Mike, Robbie, or Adrian. These guys meet with me. We talk about where we feel God's taking us on a particular Sunday morning or special service. And these guys pray about the music to pick to lead us into that service and just want to say phenomenal, phenomenal job. Robbie, you were right on because uh, I didn't give you a whole lot to work with this week. Just the title of my message. We're going to dismiss our kids at this point. Miss Jackie is in the back. She is so excited to, to have kids join her. So you guys can go back and, and meet her right now. We're so excited. They're working on all sorts of projects from worship. They got all sorts of instruments that they're learning. I love it. We're raising up our next generation of worship leaders. Uh, it's so exciting. They're getting ready for uh, our Easter egg hunt because we are going to promote our children's ministry to our community. And so they're working on that. That's a lot of great things. Uh, I know we've already prayed. I just want to pray one more time really quick. God, I pray that you would fill these lungs. God, with, with, not, with not breath of man, but breath of God. Lord, I pray for the power of your word to be planted in our hearts. God, I love your word, and I love the ability to be able to preach it. Lord, once again, I ask that your anointing and spirit would come upon me. And that, God, it would not be man who speaks today, but, Lord, it is the Spirit through a man. Lord, we give you praise, glory, and honor. And God's people said, when I, when I feel the presence of God, I get emotional. <laughs> uh, tears begin to flow from me. So I apologize if you look at me and go, man, this guy just cries all the time. But the fact is, is that the Spirit is moving in a new way in our church. And he is moving in people's lives. And it gets me excited and when I sense the Spirit moving in people's lives, it just begins to pour out of me. Uh, and I just want you to know you are loved by God, and you're loved by our church this morning. I'm excited to preach this morning, and I want to start off uh, talking about breakfast cereal. So what's your favorite breakfast cereal? Raisin Bran. Raisin Bran. There's a guy who likes to be regular. Who else? I can say that. I can say that with Chris. He'll still love me tomorrow. People, are, people all of a sudden are worried. I'm not saying anything about, but I won't, I won't comment. I won't be any more, more of that. Uh, what are some other? Cinnamon Toast, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Life. Pebbles. Pebbles. <laughs> Fruity pebbles. Fruity or chocolate? Fruity. 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 What was it? Yeah. Captain <laughs> Crunch. All right. Well, what was it? Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops. <laughs> See, I could say a lot of things. I'm not saying any of those guys to all of those. I, I got some Cheerios with me this morning because I, I want to talk about the life of a Cheerio. And this is the moment in service where the board all of a sudden thought to themselves, Pastor Eric may be on too much cough medication for him to be preaching. We should have had Jackie or Robin preach this morning. But give the Holy Spirit a few moments because I think this is going to make sense. If, if Cheerios were living, if they were alive, live, and, and they're, here they are on the production line, and they're, they're, they're born, and they're there, and they're, they're put in this box, their whole purpose is about the fact to get to this point where they are eaten, <laughs> right? That's what they would be looking forward to. That's, that is the goal. That's the end result, and so think about that for a moment. They go through this process, they're put on a shelf, but then somebody buys the box, and the box goes home. And if you're like us, we, we, we tend to have one that's kind of stowed away. So then the box sits in a shelf for a while, and finally, it's time, right? And the, the, they, can, they can hear the sound of the lid being pulled open, and then the, they see the daylight, and then the bag is opened up, Oh, man, and the excitement begins to build. This is the moment. This is the moment we were made for. Oh, and then they're, they're poured into the breakfast bowl, and the excitement just keeps coming. They're really excited now 
right? We're so close. We're getting so close to seeing this thing fulfilled. And then the silver one comes, right? The silver one shows up and it's in there. And then you go to your fridge to get that gallon of milk only to find that it's not there. Oh, but it's worse if you're a parent because you open the fridge and realize as you open the milk and you pour it, the only thing that your kids have left you with is bloop, 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 bloop. Have you been there? These guys were waiting. Where's the, where's the milk? Where's the milk? I came with expectation, and all I get is bloop, bloop. That's it. That's all there is. Can I tell you that sometimes life gives us bloop, bloop? Sometimes it's bloop, bloop. Have you ever been there? High expectations about something that, that you're going to be doing, someplace you'll be going. Maybe it's a vacation, or maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job, or a ministry, or an event, and high expectation only to have bloop, bloop. Like, where's the flow? Where's the milk? And then what do you do? You, you got to rather, like... You eat it dry, or some of you are brave, and you pour some orange juice on this thing. Uh, you all say that. You, some of you have done it. I won't say who, but I know some of you. Expectations not met, and then there's bloop, bloop. But I want to tell you something. Jesus doesn't want you to have a bloop, bloop life. Jesus doesn't want you to have a bloop, bloop life. That doesn't mean that there's not times where life goes bloop, bloop. But just because you have a moment in time of that doesn't mean that your whole life is meant to be that. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the one who stole your milk. I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Let me ask you, I just got to know if it's just me. When you pour milk in your cereal, how many of you pour like you so you can't see the milk? How many of you pour until they just start to float? How many of you drowned your cereal in milk? That's it. All right. Everybody else, we're praying for your salvation. So it's okay. But listen, Jesus wants you to have life to the full. Life to the full does not mean that we're, when we're all of a sudden serving Jesus and we're living life to the full, that there's not moments where things go bloop bloop in our life. But it means that God is not done working in our life. I want to take you to another passage of Scripture, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Great Hallmark card, but even more powerful as a Scripture we need to apply in our life. But I think a lot of times we envision this Scripture wrong. We think to ourselves, we take this and we go, okay, trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean on my understanding, and God will make the paths before me straight. The problem with that is that would then not be what the scripture actually says. Because if the, Jesus made the path straight, I wouldn't need to trust on my, not, not trust on my own understanding. I'd trust my own understanding. I can walk a straight line. That's easy. Here it says, hey, don't trust your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. What it's saying is as we begin to trust God, and God takes us on this road where we're not sure what tomorrow brings. We're not sure how we're going to get out of the mess we're in. We're not sure how things are going to end up. As we lean into him, and almost as we fall forward in Jesus, and as we take these steps together and individually as a church, and all of a sudden what's going to happen is we look back and we go, Jesus had a plan the whole time. He's made the path straight as I've trusted in him, as I've stepped into the unknown, as I've stepped into these crazy ideas and crazy things that God, God might just do something. I mean, look at the Bible. It's full of these amazing, colorful characters who really had no idea what they were doing, <laughs> who just fell forward in Jesus 
and he made the pathway straight. Esther didn't want to show up. She didn't even want to be there. Yet God would use her in such a powerful way where there seemed to be no way God made a way. Noah built an ark. Build a what now? Hadn't even seen it rain before. He's like, hey, we're going to build a giant boat. And we're going to put, it's going to be the first floating zoo. And the what? 120 years. 120 years. Putting hammer to wood, building this giant thing. He had no idea. He was just falling forward into God. But God would make the path straight. God knows what he's doing. Jesus knows what he's doing. The Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. When life gives you bloop, bloop, Jesus isn't done working. It's a situation for you to see him work more in your life. So let's talk about how do you move forward? If you're here this morning and you're in a bloop, bloop moment, how do you begin to move forward? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 6. Let's jump back into Acts. It's important to note that we're taking a time jump here. We're now two to three years from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't tell you that in the scripture, but I had to do some digging to figure this out. We're now two to three years of the church living and thriving and building and growing. And this is what it says in verse 6. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing... The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, which we'll talk about more later in the book of Acts, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, who we'll talk about more. And then he, they also chose uh, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests, now this is important, this last part. It's all important, but this is, you don't leave this out. A large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The religious began to be set free from the religion, and they began to find Jesus. Instead of walking through emotions, instead of pretending to be the church, they started becoming the church. It went from a dead religion to a living relationship with Jesus. That's powerful stuff. So we see in this picture, or in the scripture, that God's spirit is moving. God's church is growing. And some conflicts, some problems, some growing pains have arisen. So let's take a deeper look into what the problem actually was. Let's dig a little deeper. The church was experiencing growing pains, and this was making it difficult for the apostles to minister to everybody. The Grecians were Greek-speaking Jews who had come to Palestine from other nations and therefore may not have spoken Aramaic, while the Hebrews were Jewish residents of the land who spoke both Aramaic and Greek. The fact that the outsiders were being neglected created a situation that could have divided and split the church. However, the apostles handled the problem with great wisdom and did not give Satan a foothold in the fellowship. When the church faces serious problems, it presents the leaders and members of a church with a number of great opportunities to see God do something new. God loves to do new things. But the church has to begin to step into those. So as the Spirit begins to move and work in a church, there's a few things that we can expect and that we will see happen. One, a developing or a deepening in our awareness of who God is. Our perspective of who God, who Jesus, who the Holy Spirit is, will change. We'll begin to perceive them in a different way than we have before. 
Number two, Jesus is glorified and worship goes deeper. Our acts of worship become more meaningful to us. Our worship becomes intentional instead of something that's a byproduct. Number three, individual identity changes. We begin to change how we view ourselves because our view of God has changed. We view ourselves differently and we view others differently. And personal holiness begins to increase. This isn't something that comes from the pulpit. This is something that comes out of a personal, deepening relationship with our Lord and the Holy Spirit. So personal holiness will increase. Evangelism will become a priority in the church, and people will eventually start getting saved. So far, it sounds good. This sounds great. But then number five, the need for structural change occurs. It's at number five that most people abandon ship. They start to bail. It's at number five that most churches aren't willing to go through because we like the way that we do things. It's comfortable. But I want to tell you, when, a God, when God begins to move in a church, structural change has to occur, both in individual lives and as a church body. It's something that must occur. We've got to see change in how we think, how we do things, in our routine. It will happen, or if we don't, the move will come to an end. So let's look at what the church did. Some widows, some outsiders were being overlooked. Bloop, bloop. The leaders in the church came with expectations. They're seeing God do great things. And all of a sudden, people are coming in. They're like, this is happening. Not what they expected. Bloop, bloop. It's not what they expected. What about the widows that were being overlooked? They're an expectation. Bloop, bloop. It's not working out the way they thought. These ladies must have felt like Cheerios with no milk. Do we not have a purpose? Do we not have a place? The leadership of the church realized that they had to make some structural changes. We have to change how we are doing ministry to continue to be effective and continue to see God do great things. We can't move forward doing things the same way. So let's go and see how they embrace this new change. Acts 6.3 says, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit of wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention and prayer to the ministry of the word. A lot of us look at this and we think to ourselves, well, these guys that they chose, they're not really doing a whole lot. They're serving tables. Let's just really get real. Let's just pull the veil back. A lot of people don't want to serve at tables because it's not enough attention for them. They don't get noticed. That's it, no recognition. I'm not up on the platform. I'll serve when I get a chance to preach. I'm just going to tell you flat out, don't want this position unless God calls it, <laughs> calls you. All right, because I'm going to tell you, if I wasn't called, I wouldn't be here. I was talking with somebody this week, and we were having a conversation. They're like, when you decide to walk in the calling of a pastor, you think that the enemy beats you up in your life? Let me tell you, it's like going from the playground to heavyweight boxing with Mike Tyson, all right? And if you don't put in the effort and you don't put in the, the regular time and the regular practice, you will get whooped spiritually. But we look at it and go, oh, it's below me. It's beneath me. It's just serving tables. But it's not just serving tables. It's serving people. It's serving people. And more than that, it's worshiping Jesus. When we serve, it's just not serving the church or serving our community or serving our neighborhood or serving our family. It's worship to the king. But we don't think of it that way. We think that worship is this, this time and service where we, 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 we sing or we praise, we do worship or praise, and that's, that's the window of worship. But worship is so much more than that. It's such a larger component of our spiritual life. Worship is what we do and how we do it. It's the decisions and choices that we make every day. Those are acts of worship. 
It's what you say to your coworkers, your boss, your spouse, your kids. It's how you respond to situations. It's when we mess up and we go and we make things right. It's all worship and serving is a phenomenal opportunity to worship the king. It is an amazing opportunity of worship. And I would say it's far more meaningful to our Savior than the songs we sing. When we're willing to serve others, because the word says Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. We walk in the footsteps of our master. Yeah, but this is, this is so menial. No one's going to notice. Let me tell you something. That is not a true statement. I guarantee you the widows noticed. But let's take the people component out of it. What if nobody noticed? Jesus notices. Jesus notices. Oh, there was a piece of paper in the sanctuary. I should, I should go tell the janitor they need to do a better job cleaning. Or you could pick the piece of paper up and put it in the trash can and call it worship. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, just maybe. Too much? <laughs> did I go too far? Look at what they did. Look at this. They began to serve. And this isn't, this isn't something where, where the disciples go, it's beneath us. They said, because look what they said. They said, give us some people who are filled with the Spirit to wait some tables. That's a qualification, no joke. Give me people who are in love with Jesus. Give me some people who will actually make this an act of worship. And we'll give this to them, and they will serve faithfully because they serve the Lord faithfully. There are no big and little jobs in the kingdom of God. There is just service to the king. That's it. At the end of the day, that's it. This is the first position that I have ever served where God called me to a place. Every position that I have ever done in ministry leading up to this point God called me to a person. He called me to a lead pastor whom I was to serve, who I would connect my life with. My job was very simple. The pastor comes up with a vision. My job is to make it come to fruition. My job is to serve. And that was it. That was it. And my first ministry position was an internship. For a year, a year, I served a pastor in Norfolk, Nebraska. Mark Rose, we have a great relationship. He would validate these stories 100%. When I showed up, the one thing that God told me was, you serve the man, you don't complain. I showed up in my first week. Mark, I come in, we spend mornings in prayer. We would go, I show up in his office. Mark goes, I got a job for you today. He took me outside, he gave me a bucket, he gave me some soap, he gave me a scrub brush and a toothbrush, and he said, I want you to wash the siding to the entire church, a building about our size. Used the hose to wipe it down, showed me exactly how he wanted it done, gave me a ladder, and left me alone. And for an hour and a half, I took that scrub brush and my soap and that toothbrush, and I cleaned that siding the best I could. An hour and a half later, Mark came out and never complained. Took me around the corner, and the back of his truck was a power washer. Three weeks after that, there's a ladies' event at church. I will never forget this ladies' event. We will never run a ladies' event like this at this church. I forget what the theme was, but all I know is we had to have all of this appliances. Right? We had a tr truck pull up, and we had to unload appliances. I don't know, there was a stove and a fridge, and there was couches and all sorts of stuff. So we unloaded it all. And then they wanted this entire room that was bigger than the room that we're in right now, all with black sheets all the way across it. And I spent two days ironing. <laughs> I learned how to iron as an intern in a church. These black sheets, so this room would have black walls. I never complained. Six weeks into my internship, I was in a project cleaning. I was on my hands and knees doing a project for the pastor. When he came to me and he said, everything I've thrown at you to break you, you have served well. 
He goes, you will never touch another scrub brush in this church again because now it's time to go impact people's lives. You've learned how to serve. You've learned how to worship. Now let's go. Let's make a difference in people's lives. Serving is an avenue to God's power. Because three months after that, I was in a prayer meeting with just a few people. Just a few people from the church we were praying together. Me, the intern, as we're in a circle, I say to these guys, I see this entire section full of young people. We had 12 students. I said, I see this entire section of the church filled with young people. The pastor was there. And I, I don't think, no, so he, he's told me this before. He's like, in that moment, I thought, well, that doesn't come to pass. I am going to whoop you with that statement at some point. Because he's like, there's no way that'll happen. But three months later, that entire section was full of young people. And a revival began to pour out in Norfolk, Nebraska. And drug addicts began to be set free. Alcoholics began to be set free. They stopped going to the bar and they started coming to church. And they started serving. And we saw an amazing move of God. If you don't believe me, you can read about it in a book called Soul Winning. Because it's written about it in there. And the people's lives that were touched and changed forever. Serving is the gateway to God's power. Too many people want power and control. But God's power is for those who learn how to serve and worship first. Because it balances it out. Church, are you willing to serve? Are you willing to let your structure be changed in your life? Let's end by talking about the structure of the church. A majority of our churches, especially in America, 10% of the church does 90% of the work. 10% of the people in church do 90% of the work. The reason we don't see a greater move of God in our nation is not because of bad pastors or poor doctrine. It's simply put this way. The church doesn't show up. The church doesn't show up. What God wants to do, it takes all of us. It takes a village to get it done. But when 10% of the church only shows up, it limits what God can do. And you might think to yourself, I don't believe in that doctrine. You can't limit God. Well, let me prove it to you through Scripture because the Holy Spirit says it himself. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given uh, through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by, by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distri uh, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. You are a gift to the church. Every single one of you here, you are a gift. And you might go, I don't feel like I, 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 I have any of these gifts. There's more than that, okay? There, but you have something inside of you that God is putting in you and developing in you to do something with, to be a blessing to the church, to be a blessing to our community. But if we do events, if we do things, and only 10% of the church shows up, 90% of the gifts are missing. 90% of the gifts aren't here, aren't available. How many lives are missed because the church just doesn't show up? How many salvations are missed because the church doesn't show up to serve? And I, listen, I want to be really clear. I'm not saying to be involved in everything because that's not healthy. That is not healthy. Even for a church our size, not healthy. We're not, I have seen churches do this. We are not going down that road. And I am all for, for you getting away and taking a vacation and taking family. I'm all for that. We need to do that from time to time. And I'm very grateful that we have online for those who can't make it here 
And for those who are sick, like last week, I was able to be a part of the service. I was so glad that we offer that for those reasons. But I'm just going to tell you, show up. Show up. You may think that you don't even do anything on a Sunday morning, but just showing up gives God an opportunity to move in a greater way in our church. D.L. Moody said, the more we use the means and opportunities we have, the more ability and opportunities will be increased. But we've got to use what's in front of us. And listen, we're about to go into a sprint for two weeks. We can't keep this pace up all the time because we would all wear out really quick. But we're about to go into a two-week sprint for ministry. And I want to share with you how you can get involved. The first one I've already mentioned, Sunday morning, show up. And listen, I'm not, again, it's not about vacation, and it's not, not, about, not about if you're sick. I get that. But don't sleep in going, I'll just watch church later. Come on, get up, be here, be a part of what God's doing. You don't know. You might miss out on a miracle in your own life that you would have had if you would have just been here. Show up, be here, because God wants you here, and God wants to change and transform your life. Next Sunday, come sing with us. I know you guys can sing. I heard you this morning. We got these brand new set of drums. All of a sudden, I can hear everybody. I'm like, our church can sing. You should come sing with us. I'll dress just like that guy in that picture next week, okay? Listen, we got an opportunity to go be a blessing in our community. It's Easter time. We're going to go to two facilities. First off, we're going to feed you lunch, and it's free. Like, okay, that's a pretty good deal. Like, it's not going to be T-bone steaks, but it, we're going to feed you, all right? And it's free. You, nobody else is doing that in town next Sunday. So we'll feed you a meal, and we'll go over the songs, and you might be like, I don't know how to use a hymnal. That's okay, because I asked Hannah to print out all the songs. We got them all. And we're going to go over the songs once, so you may not know them. That's okay. Young, old, and in between, come be a part and be a blessing to some people who maybe nobody has come to visit for a year. Whose family may not ever come to visit them. We're just going to show up and love on them and sing some songs and shake some hands and maybe have an opportunity to pray for somebody. Maybe have an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. Maybe an opportunity for someone to get saved. How cool would that be? Come sing with us. And like I said, it's not all afternoon. It's two facilities, right? Lunch, practice, two facilities. You get to go home. You still get your Sunday late afternoon and evening. But let's go be a blessing. We got Good Friday on April 7th, just under two weeks away, 6.30 p.m. Come be a part of worship and prayer. Adrian and I are working on this service. It's going to be three components. We're going to talk about repentance, restoration, and prayer. We're going to have moments of worship, and we're going to have an opportunity to pray for what God has been doing, and what we want to see God continue to do in our community. Come be a part. We've got, sat we've got on Saturday, April 8th, we've got a community egg hunt. I'm so excited about this, and people in our community seem to be excited about it. We've got about 8,000 eggs. We've got three different age groups that we're going to do this thing for. Our we're going to highlight our children's ministry that day. It's an all-outdoor event, and who knows? We may put the eggs out on Friday, and then they will give out shovels on Saturday for the kids to find the eggs, if that's what happens. It's all good, and we'll be picking up eggs all spring long. I don't know, but I need workers. The church needs workers from 9 to noon on that Saturday, or maybe just a little bit past noon. But we need a parking team. We need at least six people on that. We need... I don't know, egg placement, egg laying team, whatever you want to call yourselves, because we got to put 8,000 eggs in these three locations on our property. We, so we need about eight people that can do that. We need, we need people that can work registration. We need about 12 people at that to make it quick and, and just fast. We need tent set up. We need cleanup. And we need people to pray. And Jackie's going to share a gospel message. We're going to give a gift to every kid. We've got a grand prize basket with a cool family package deal that we're doing. We're giving away so we can get some registrations. And then we're going to let them go get all the candy they can eat. And by the way, just to, uh, so FYI, all the candy is in eggs. If you're picking up something that looks like a Tootsie Roll, it's not a Tootsie Roll. Okay? I cannot help. We've got dozens of deer out here. We're doing the best we can. You want to help? Wednesday is 6 p.m. right now. We're filling all these eggs. You might think that's, that's beneath me. That's not real ministry. But you know what? Really cool things happen at the table. Great conversations happen. So come fill, fill some eggs with candy this week. 
on Wednesday, 6 p.m. Beyond that, look at the spring. Well, I know that's hard to believe, but spring is coming. <laughs> and we're going to have to mow this lawn, and we've got a, a new mower and a new trimmer, and we need help. Every week we're going to need to mow the lawn. Every other week we need to trim. There's a sign-up sheep in our, our four here. You can come and be a part of that and, and serve and make it a part of worship. Worship team, if you come back to the platform, we're about to end. There are no, no small acts of service when they are considered acts of worship. Big and small, we get to worship the king. But I got to thinking about this passage of scripture, and what, what would happen if next week 40 to 50% of our church went and sang and blessed people? That'd be pretty cool. What if 60% showed up for a Good Friday praise and prayer service here? What would happen if 80 to 90% of our people, our church, showed up and said, we're willing to serve on this Easter egg thing from 9 to 1230 on a Saturday to love on people and to come and worship Jesus? What would begin to happen? What would Easter Sunday look like, I wonder? Maybe the clue is given to us in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Because after they served, this is what it says. So the word of God spread. The numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests, those stuck in religion, became obedient to faith. I started off this morning talking about the life of cereal. And if you feel like bloop, bloop is where you're at great thing about our king is he's got another gallon of milk in the fridge. He doesn't run out. And I think sometimes when we're hurt, sometimes when we're weak, when sometimes we're wounded, our natural response is to disconnect. I'm going to tell you that what you need to do is the opposite. When I'm hurting the most, when I'm wounded the most are the moments where my service becomes a deeper expression of my worship. And in those moments, I find that God does things in and through me I never could have imagined. That same principle, I believe, is true for you. You got bloop bloop going on? Find a place to serve. Pick just one of these things to serve at. Bring your family. Teach them how to serve. Because you're teaching them how to worship. Would you stand to your feet this morning? The altar call isn't here. The altar call is out there. It's serving we have sign-up sheets in our foyer for the events we talked about. We'd love to see all those get filled up. If they don't, I'm still going to come and serve because I believe in a gracious, amazing God. And if there is one thing that I know, our Savior is not done moving in our city. He craves people to have a relationship with him there is nothing else that matters to him. It's, his love so abounds in that way. It is so incredibly huge. As I begin to ask God to show me how he loves our city and what he wants for our city, it is breaking me how much he wants to love on people, connect them, restore them, move in their life, and he wants you to be a part of that. Man, how blessed are we, church? There's people in Ukraine today that are wondering if they'll live to see tomorrow. They're still serving and having church. We live in America. We've got it so easy, and we'd rather sit in the recliner than take a couple hours out of our week to serve the king. Come on, we can do better. We can do better. Let's serve, let's learn how to worship. 
Lord, I believe this morning, it's not, it's not a message to beat people up, but it's a message for us to realize that our worship has to be connected to service. That, Lord, it's not about a position. It's about serving you. It's about serving others. It's not about us getting recognition. Lord, the fact that you see it should be recognition enough for us. Lord, we talk about wanting to move, and we pray for wanting to move, but a move of you requires a move of your people. It requires us to structurally change things, and over the next couple of years, we're going to have to make some changes. And we will follow you in that process. But today, Lord, would you just stir in our hearts one way we can serve? Just one thing out of the next two weeks in this marathon, in this sprint that we're in, Lord, just to, to be able to go, I'm going to serve there, and I'm going to make it worship to you. Lord, I, I remember. I remember what you did in Norfolk. I remember watching people get set free. I remember watching the church fill up with young people who began to just have a passion to serve. Lord, I believe you can do it again. But we've got to be willing to let you move in us and change us. God, it all is about the small acts of service because there are no small acts of service when they are worshipped to you. Lord, we pray over our offering today as well. Lord, as we give, may we do so with a cheerful heart, with a heart of worship. That God, what we give would go further than we ever thought possible. That you would continue to use this little church to do big things in our community and around the globe. God, as we send our young people out, to make a difference. Oh, what a legacy we will leave for the next generation of this church. As we prioritize missions, as we prioritize service, as we prioritize worship and your word, God, I believe there will be a massive legacy left to the next generation of this church and this community. Spirit, move in your people stir in us a heart of worship and a heart of service. As we leave today, church, before we walk out the door, let's seal what God has spoken to us by worshiping one last time together, and then you are dismissed. Robbie, would you lead us one more time today? Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God.
Remind us this week that you are the way maker. Wherever we go, whoever we talk with, God, may we lift up our worship to you. Because worship is the way we live our lives, not just the way we sing a song. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.